Hi, I'm Graham Priest and this is the third in a series of short lectures on logic. So what I'm going to do today is to explain to you something called classical logic. Now, in the first lecture in this series, I explained to you that what modern logicians think of logic about is validity, and especially deductive validity. So I'm going to explain to you uh, a theory of deductive validity, and it's called classical logic. Um, the name is slightly misleading because it has nothing to do with the great classical civilizations of Rome and Greece, but it's classical in another sense. Namely that uh, if you do a first course in logic nowadays, uh, it's probably the logical system that you'll be taught. Uh, it was actually invented by a German logician, Gottlob Frege, towards the end of the 19th century and polished up by uh, a number of other logicians in the 20th century such as Bertrand Russell and David Hilbert. So, um, what you will get out of this lecture is an understanding of how modern logicians attempt to articulate uh, a theory of validity. That is, they give an account of what sorts of inferences are valid and why. Okay, so here we go. First of all, inferences have premises and conclusions. And premises and conclusions are formulated in language. They're statements. Um, but natural languages are really irregular and idiomatic. Uh, and this, this produces a lot of um, unnecessary complexities. So what logicians do now nowadays is that they don't use a natural language to express premises and conclusions. They use a simple formal language. Uh, the language has uh, a very simple grammar, it's regular, has a regular syntax, and you can give it a regular semantics, that is, an account of truth and falsity. Um, the formal language, in some sense, approximates the essential parts of natural language, uh, although because it doesn't have all the idiosyncrasies and complexities, it's much, much easier to deal with. So, first of all, I need to give you the details of a simple formal language. And this is sometimes called the propositional calculus because uh, it's, uh, it deals with propositions and it doesn't have many of the other complexities of more complex formal languages. So, uh, first of all, the language has some very simple sentences which uh, have no internal structure. These are called propositional parameters sometimes propositional variables. And uh, they're often written, as you can see on the screen, by the letters P, Q, R, and maybe some more. Given these simple sentences, we can build more complex sentences with something that logicians call connectives. These are grammatical constructions which uh, take sentences and produce more complex sentences. So, uh, on the screen, you will see three connectives. The first is a sort of an angle, uh, and you can think of that as saying, it's not the case that. So, logicians sometimes call this negation. The second connective is an ampersand, and uh, you can think of this as and. Logicians call this conjunction. And the V sign, which is after, is, you can think of this as or. Logicians call it disjunction. So let's have a look at how those connectives can be used to construct more complex sentences. So you can see that I've got these three sentences, simple sentences, P, Q, and R. And to help you think of what's going on, I'll suppose that they represent something. So I'm going to suppose that P represents the claim that Pompeii is in Italy. Q represents the claim that Quito is in Peru and R represents the claim that Russia is in South America. So think of P, Q, and R like that. If you think of that, then what does mm, the, se uh, the sentence, the complex sentence, of P prefixed by a negation sign mean? So not P. Well, it means it's not the case that Pompeii is in Italy. Or, more colloquially, you might say Pompeii is not in Italy. So not P represents the claim that Pompeii is not in Italy. What about P, V, Q? Well, remember that V means or, 
And so uh, given that P and Q represent the things I've said, then PVQ represents the disjunction that either Pompeii is in Italy or Quito is in Peru. And for conjunction, that's and, Q and R represents uh, the conjunction Quito is in Peru and Russia is in South America. So you can see that using these connectors with simple sentences, we can build up more complex sentences. And we can build up lots more complex sentences than that by iterating these procedures, but we don't need to go into that. So, for example, a more complex sentence might be something like P and Q, or it's not the case that R. And if you like, you can try translating that into English or Italian, thinking of P and Q and R in the way that I have just explained to you. So, these are the details of a very simple formal language. And the formal language is used to express premises and conclusions of our inferences. OK, now we're in a position to start to give an account of validity for the sentences of that language. A deductive inference is one where it's impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion not to be true. That's what I explained in the first lecture. But how do you understand it when I say it's impossible? Well, logicians understand it like this. Um, you must think that there are situations, and an inference is valid if every situation in which the premises are true, the conclusions are true. OK, so far, so good. But what's a situation? Well, a situation is technically just a way of dividing up the simple sentences into the trues and the falses. So. You can think of this as represented by a diagram. So here's a diagram which represents an interpretation. Uh, I've labelled it A, so that you can refer back to it if you want to. You can see two circles, and I've labelled them T and F. So the sentences in the T circle are the ones that are true, and the sentences in the F circle are the ones that are F. Now. Um, if you think of P and Q and R as having the meanings that I said just now, this is a situation which gets things right, OK? So P was Pompeii is in Italy, that is indeed true. Q was Quito is in Peru, that's false, it's in Ecuador. And R was Russia in South America, which is of course false because it's in Europe. But that gives an illustration of one situation. Now, another situation is um, given to you by the different distribution, the different pair of circles which I've labelled B. So, uh, in this situation, P and Q are true, and R is false. So, I if you think of Q being uh, Quito is in Peru, this is not an actual situation. It's a kind of hypothetical situation uh, where Peru... Uh, uh, actually conquered Ecuador sometime in the past. So situations don't have to be actual, they can be hypothetical. And um, technically speaking, any division of the simple sentences into T and F is a situation. So every simple sentence occurs in one and only one of those two circles. It's either true or it's false, not both, not neither. So that's what a situation is. Now, we're not quite ready to define validity yet, because a situation will tell you the truth values, as logicians put it, of the simple sentences. What about the more complex sentences? Well, given a situation, we use a set of rules to compute the truth values, the T's or the F's, of the more complex sentences, given the truth values of their components. So let's deal with negation first. The rule for negation is this, which you can see on the screen. Not A is true just if A is false. And similarly, not A is false just if A is true. So negation is an operator that takes something true to something false and something false into something true. Now, 
if you refer back to the situation A I depicted, here it is again, and as before, P is in the true circle and Q and R are in the false circle. Now Q is in the false circle, so its negation must be in the true circle, and that's exactly where it is. And P is in the true circle, so its negation is in the false circle, and that's exactly where it is. So that's how negation works. It takes truths into falses, false into truths. What about disjunction, or what are the conditions which put sentences of the form P or Q in the true circle or the false circle? Well, the conditions are given you uh, in what you can see in front of you. A disjunction A or B is true if either A or B is in the true circle. And a disjunction A or B is in the false circle if both A and B are in the false circle. So, have a look at the uh, situation which I called A. Here it is. You'll see that P is in the true circle and Q and R are in the false circle. So P or R is true because P is true. So I put P or R in the P circle. But both Q and R are in the false circle. So that makes Q or R false. So I put that in the false circle. So we've just had a look at negation, not, and disjunction, or. What about the third of our connectives, and? Well, the rules we use to compute the truth value of and are these, and you can see them on the screen. A and B is true just if, well, A is true and B is true. And A and B is false just if either A or B, or maybe both, are false. So let me show you an illustration. So come back to the situation I described. This is the second one. We called it B. So in this situation, P and Q were in the true circle and R was in the false circle. Now, P and both P and Q are in the true circle, so their conjunction is in the true circle. So I've written P and Q in the true circle. And uh, R is in the false circle, so the conjunction of R with anything else is in the F circle. So I've written P and R in the false circle. Okay. So given a situation that is a partition of the simple sentences and the trues and the falses, we can use those rules to compute the truth values, the trues or the falses of the more complex sentences. So we're now at last in a position to define validity. Um, a valid inference is one such that in any situation, whenever all the premises are in the true circle, the conclusion is in the true circle too. It's a nice simple definition. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples so you can see how it works in practice. So this is the first example. And it concerns an inference that's sometimes called the disjunctive syllogism. The premises are P and either not P or Q. And the conclusion is Q. So it says, well, if so let's suppose that P and let's suppose that it's not P or Q, then Q. Now this is valid. Let's see why. So below is an interpretation, the trues and the falses. Now, let's suppose that the premises are indeed true. They're in the true circle. So I've written both P and not P or Q in the true circle. OK. Well, if P is in the true circle, its negation, not P, must be in the false circle. So I've written it there. Now, we know that not P or Q is in the true circle, and not P is in the false circle. So for that disjunction, not P or Q, to be true, one of the disjuncts has got to be true, and it can't be not P. So it's got to be Q. So Q must be in the true circle, and that's where I've written it. So what we've seen is that if we assume that the premise is in the true circle, the conclusion's got to be in the true circle too, and that's what it means to be valid. Let me give you an example of an invalid inference. 
So this is the inference from P or Q to P and Q. That doesn't sound very plausible if you think about it. So uh, can we find a situation which makes the premise true and a conclusion not true? Well, it's not too difficult. Uh, the one that I have drawn for you does just the trick. So we've put P in the true circle and Q in the false circle. R is irrelevant. OK. Now, because P is in the true circle, P or Q is in the true circle. But because Q is in the false circle, P and Q is in the false circle. So it's not in the true circle. So in this situation, P or Q is in the true circle, and P and Q is not in the true circle. So this tells us the inference is invalid. Now, in fact, there are algorithms which allow you to compute. If I give you an inference, what's valid and what's not, but we don't need to go into the details here. What we've done is, uh, if, you, if, you understood, if you've understood where we've gone, you have the basics of a contemporary account of validity. And what we've seen is that validity is given not for sentences of a natural language, but sentences of a formal language. The formal language has simple sentences with no internal grammatical structure, and then we use those to make more complex sentences with connectives like and and or and not. A situation is just a division of the simple sentences into the trues and the falses, and then we can use the rules for the connectives to compute the truth or falsity values of the more complex sentences and an inference is valid just if any situation in which all the premises are in the true circle, the conclusion is in the true circle too. Well, that's a very swift introduction to uh, classical propositional logic. Uh, what you need to do now is a few examples, and it may be that your teacher will be happy to give you some.